This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. This talk about the just transition, how it's being spun to oil and gas workers as an attempt to kill their industry and kill their jobs, obviously, oil and gas is going to be phased out and we should be doing everything we can to equip and empower a skilled workforce to be able to adjust and to find new employment in these new and emerging industries. Would you agree? Is there a number higher than 100%? Because if so, that would be my answer. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. That was Max Fawcett yesterday on the show. Welcome to Real Talk on this Thursday. Coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to talk to pollster and political strategist David Hurley. Uh, you probably subscribe to a whole bunch of Canadians do to his podcast, The Hurley Burley. Uh, he just welcomed Rachel Notley, Alberta's opposition leader, NDP leader, of course, uh, to his most recent episode. We're going to get David's take on, on the political landscape in Alberta, the angst and anger, the alienation that Albertans, or at least many of them, uh, say that they feel toward Ottawa, and there's no reason to believe that they're stretching the truth. Plus, what's going on in Ontario? Doug Ford and this controversy around his daughter's stag and doe party. You've been paying attention to this, 150 bucks a ticket. People want to know who organized it, who collected the money, and where did it all go? Doug Ford says, the Premier of Ontario, the boys handled it. He says nobody can influence the Fords, but there's a lot of development happening in Ontario's, uh, in the Greenbelt, rather, in the Toronto area, and people want to know if there's something that stinks. We'll talk about John Tory. Uh, Tomorrow's his last day as Toronto's mayor as he steps down, resigning after uh, light uh, servicing of an affair with a staffer. And, of course, Caroline Mulrooney demands that she resigned. So there's a lot happening, a scandal, a suggestion, and otherwise in Ontario's political landscape. And of course, David Hurley keeping an eye on all that. And I'm looking forward to checking in this morning as well with Winnipeg Free Press columnist Shelley Cook. She's going to join us. Uh, John, she just published a, a great piece just a couple of days ago in the Free Press, Childhood Myths will be missed. Okay. Uh, she's talking about she was grocery shopping with her seven-year-old daughter. And uh, parents will let you know this is, this is maybe sort of going to be an an earmuffs type interview Mm -hmm. you're going to want to listen to this interview in an appropriate setting or scenario we know some of you have real talk streaming in the background with little ones around they're in the grocery store they're walking through the aisle and her daughter asks mommy is the easter bunny real oh my it's all over the daughter the daughter's spidey senses are tingling she's got questions about the magic and and shelly will tell us the story when she joins us in about a half an hour's time but she said what 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 made you ask that sweetie which is a veteran parenting move answer a question with a question if you need to buy yourself some time did you hear it somewhere i don't know i mean maybe at school but uh but her daughter says to her well i haven't seen any magical bunnies running around and so (laughs) so she has her questions and so shelly who's a skilled a really talented storyteller and columnist out of winnipeg uh wrote a wrote a column about it about about that that stage of childhood when should you tell magical stage of wonderment i made an incredible mistake in my radio career the first year i was doing Doing it, there was a story about a teacher in school and earmuffs if you've got kids listening now. But basically, the teacher told his entire class that Santa Claus did not exist. Oh, jeez! And all these kids went home to the parents, and of course, they were all obviously outraged at the teacher <laughs> the next day. But I told this story on air. Stupid of me, on a pop radio station very well known one here in edmonton and afterwards the texts rolling in were like you idiot <laughs> you've just created a huge problem for us how many kids do you think were in the car listening to you so yeah yeah man so i'm looking forward to that conversation with shelly cook and we expect at some point today we're, we're hoping to be graced i never know this, uh, with this guy but <laughs> with this guy you never know what's going to happen uh he, he goes by max savage uh that's what he had written across his his torso uh, in what appears to be 
uh, permanent marker because it stayed on as he went swimming. This is crazy. In the water hazard on, on holes 16 and 17 in Phoenix, Arizona. It, of course, it was the Waste <laughs> Management Phoenix Open last weekend. It was a week ago tomorrow that Max Savage uh, evaded security and police for quite some time. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> pole dancing with the flag on 16, running down the fairway on 17, and uh, and eventually spending <laughs> some time in the water, uh, standing on the waste management logo for quite some time until he was taken into custody. His mugshot has gone viral as maybe this one of the greatest of all time. Beauty. And he's got it uh, printed onto T-shirts now, and he says that the, the fundraiser uh, that happens as a result of selling these t-shirts is going to help him with his bail money and his associated legal costs and so if mac is able to join us today we'll look forward to that conversation we have been chatting with him offline so do you have like when you think of the greatest mug shot of all time is there one that pops to mind i like the uh who's the guy there was a there's Frank Sinatra, like way that back is an in amazing the day when he was when he was a kid if you google right now there's a lot of celebs who have had their time with the mug shot. Nick Nolte's got an amazing one. Uh, yeah, oh, that, that one's great, too. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Sinatra mug shot to me is like this. This one is like, you know, old blue eyes here. Like, you know, obviously a handsome devil. And this was before he was there you uh, the global phenom. Of course, b- before he was well known to all, this was this was uh, based on some uh, at the at the time relatively prudish policy and legislation. This was uh, you know as as a result of him having wooed a woman and uh, <laughs> and he was arrested and uh, so that's Frank Sinatra's. That's maybe the most famous mugshot of all time. But yeah. I think Max Savage's is up there. That's there, a good looking. There's one. a bunch though. Like David Bowie's is pretty pretty epic as well. And then of course I think we all saw the uh, the Tiger Woods one when he had oh, his yeah. problems as well, which was like oh yeah. That's What's going on here? <laughs> like on, on pain meds and had some things yeah, going had on. Some and a little bit glossy eyed. Yeah. And yeah, there you go. Real talk is you can let us know the most famous mugshot of all time. I know we're going to get some pushback on this. I I, I had a, a tweet this morning. I saw somebody tweeted at us and said uh, that, that streakers should not be glorified. They well, said that, 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 you know, that this is not something they said it's annoying and inconsiderate. And uh, you shouldn't be giving airtime and you shouldn't be glorifying the streaker. And so uh, we can have mixed feelings on this. Number one. The Phoenix Open is not your average golf tournament. No. Right? It's 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 uh it's probably the PGA's best answer to what's happening with the live tour, with mm-hmm. the Saudi tour. In other words, people are partying, having a great time. There's a yeah. lot of noise in the stands. There's a totally different vibe than what you have at, at Augusta, the Masters, or somewhere like that. Which is why I thought this was funny. Like, yeah. you know, it's not your typical, like, this isn't the Masters or something, right? So, yeah, but <laughs> this guy, he's, he's elusive, though. I, I'm, I'm not sure he's going to, you know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> David Hurley coming up for sure in just a minute. We also, of course, want to make sure that we take the time to get into our mailbag. We know that this politics talk is, is resonating with you because you're telling us and because our inbox is flooded every single time we start talking about what's happening uh, in Western Canada, in particular in Alberta, leading up to a late May election, we expect, and that includes this one from Andrew, uh, who was listening yesterday when Max Fawcett joined us. We opened with that clip. Of course, we talked about the just transition. We talked about a whole bunch, our star, that $20 billion essentially giveaway to oil and gas. Max argues that it's time for the Notley NDP to hit the panic button. And Daniel Smith, the premier of Alberta, hasn't even called the election yet. Andrew said, I wanted to to share my thoughts on the upcoming election, the reaction to your Wednesday show where Evan Scrimshaw and Max Fawcett brought up certainly some interesting and thought-provoking points uh, regarding the Alberta NDP's chance of winning the election. Andrew says, to preface, I'm a lifelong Albertan. I voted progressive conservative in the past, and I'm currently supporting the Alberta NDP. He says, I found Evan's arguments, Scrimshaw, arguments to be a bit more biased through a conservative lens and i found max to be a little more middle of the road he says i find the alberta ndp have been doing many of the things that evan has suggested they have not if you missed that show yesterday make sure you check it out back-to-back perspectives different approaches on the dynamics that'll factor into this election obviously there's a lot at stake you know andrew says i was relieved to see on your youtube live chat people challenging evan on a lot of what he had to say with and, and i didn't find that his rebuttals had a lot of substance you 
know, I want to remind listeners of this Alberta's Future Initiative that the NDP launched ages ago that talks specifically about policies relating to what they would be or will be running on in the next election. He says this initiative started as a grassroots conversation asking all Albertans what's important to them. If people who are unsure about what an Alberta NDP platform might look like, they can go take a look at that website. You know, he says, just Google Alberta's future. Moreover, he says, maybe the the party itself needs to do a better job reminding Albertans of the work that they've been doing. Andrew says also a friendly reminder that Rachel Notley has to balance both reacting to the many, many, many UCP fumbles, and Andrew says, I think I'm, I'm being generous in characterizing that as opposition leader since she still is in that role. Max yesterday said that she should stop doing that. He said that the, the last thing she should be doing is focusing on what Danielle Smith is doing. But Andrew goes on and he says, without doing so, Notley could be painted potentially as, as uninformed or even missing the ball on current events important to Albertans. Opposition leaders are meant to challenge the current government, and boy, does the Alberta NDP have its work cut out for it in this regard. I believe that the party has struck a fairly good balance of duties within the role of opposition and are providing a positive vision for the future as a government in waiting. Now, could they do better on delivering their message? Yeah, of course they could, he says. Of course they could. And as we get closer to the election, I feel like maybe we'll see a shift in this narrative from the NDP as they present their vision to the province. I just hope that they don't wait too long to make that pivot. Andrew says this election is all going to come down to choices, obviously, and I personally believe it's going to come down to a few things. Number one, what moderate conservatives are willing to put up with? Are they willing to give uh, Premier Smith and her united conservatives a full term, knowing the history of, of bad horrible, irresponsible governance. Furthermore, are they willing to allow a loud majority or a minority rather of extremists to hold them hostage within their own party? You know, just to consolidate power, ultimately risking leaving Alberta worse off. I think moderate conservatives, frankly, right now are shaking in their boots, scared, intimidated, intimidated, controlled by a loud minority. Without these votes, the right split. With the votes, they're endorsing a far-right vision for Alberta that could take us down a road that could leave the province in a bad position economically and continue a brain drain that could see many professionals leave the province due to fatigue from fighting a fringe-controlled government. He goes on to say, or is the choice on the moderate conservative voters of this party to cut ties with the so-called lunatics and take back control of the asylum I mean, sure, he says, they may lose the next election. Yeah, they may momentarily lose power, have some rebuilding to do. This is me talking now, Jespo. I don't think that's an option. He goes on and he says, but by doing so, they'd have a chance to rebrand their image, to win back the centrist voters that currently feel orphaned. You know, they leave the province in the hands of a capable, compassionate government in waiting that would ensure Alberta's health, education, and evolving energy industry is not plagued by an extremist agenda is the allure of power now more important to moderate conservatives than shedding themselves of the cancer that is within their ranks he signs off by saying albertans have a choice left right or center have you ever played that bar game by the way it's dice game left right center oh my gosh one of the greatest dice (laughs) games of all time but i digress he says this upcoming election will likely see the losing party need to rebuild and rebrand and he's right I mean, regardless of what happens, you lose an election like this, it'll trigger a leadership race at some point, for sure. He says, I think Albertans are asking themselves, who do we trust to bring us into the future? Who do we trust to take care of our sick and less fortunate? Who do we trust to shape the education system our children will learn about the world from? Who do we trust with our current energy industry and the need to build it in a future context? All of these files, this government... He says, have failed on and failed hard, in my opinion. This is a former conservative voter. He says, to me, I think that the United Conservative Party has a chance to continue to decimate almost every file they touch, and that scares me as an Albertan. He signs off by saying, keep up the real talk. We need it now more than ever. I appreciate listening to a show that challenges my political ideals, that helps me see the other side, even if sometimes it pisses me off. Great email. He signs off as an OG real talker I like since it. day one. David's here. There we go. David Hurley is a pollster, a political strategist, and a master storyteller with his podcast, The Hurley Burley. His most recent episode featured 
the exact person we're talking about, who we spoke to last week right here on Real Talk, Rachel Notley. Returning to the show, it's great to see your face again, my man. Of course, trolling everybody in Alberta with your Saskatchewan <laughs> billboard emblazoned across your chest per usual. How you doing? It's, <laughs> it's nice to connect with I gotta you represent, man. I gotta represent. I think Half of your audience is probably from Saskatchewan. We have good numbers in Saskatchewan, and I'm, last time you were here, you were wearing your rider's colors. What's this one? Is that is that like the provincial flower or something like that? That is the prairie lily, the provincial flower of Saskatchewan. Wow. B- born and raised out there, Dave? Absolutely. Yeah. Where exactly? Yeah. Uh, originally from a small farming village in the southwest part of the province that only has about 100 people left in it called Prelate, Saskatchewan. Wow. But really grew up in Regina. Okay, so Saskatchewan's got a really it's it's got an interesting dynamic. I was getting into this yesterday with with a friend. We're talking about insurance rates, and and I don't know if you if you've read this piece. Economist uh, Jack Mintz, I think, and it's fair to call him a conservative economist, has a piece out there in is. the Financial Post. He says freezing insurance premiums won't work. Uh, now, of course, insurance rates have skyrocketed in Alberta for a lot of people. I asked Rachel Notley about this last week. She said that if she forms government at the end of May, she will reintroduce a cap on insurance rates. She will reintroduce a cap on tuition. Mintz argues that it's the wrong move. He describes it as Soviet-style policy. Saskatchewan's had a socialist-style insurance setup for quite some time in an ardently conservative province. How do you reconcile that? Can you take us into the mindset? Lower rates, lower rates. When I was, when I turned 16, I was able to drive and get a car in Saskatchewan. Nobody that I knew my age in Alberta was able to do that. Insurance rates were just way too high. Um, And, you know, I think, I don't know much about the policy area, but Rachel Notley certainly right on the politics and Jack Mintz isn't because insurance rates, and they were a big issue in Ontario. uh, Insurance rates are, uh, when I ran the wind campaign, insurance rates are a big issue for people. I mean, driving is huge. Uh, and uh, access to a vehicle and affordable access to a vehicle is essential in Alberta. So, you know, if if that kind of cost of living pressure is on people, politicians feel a need to respond to it. You think that that's something that, I mean, resonates with, it's really interesting, right? When you start talking about government, and, and I, again, I, I'm even supercharging the conversation, editorializing it by using the word meddling, but government meddling in the free market typically hasn't flown in Alberta. You think it's a political policy that you can sell based on the premise that it'll drop your prices down? People are paying more for everything right now. You think it can resonate in a province like Alberta that typically doesn't like to see government getting its hands in business oh well in my experience as a public opinion researcher the practical realities of people's lives generally overwhelm their ideological predispositions so i think that uh if people are uh if people are having a difficult time affording uh insurance that uh the government stepping in will not be seen as ideologically wrong it will be seen as an appropriate response by most people i mean albertans let's be clear albertans (laughs) do not have a particularly conservative government um, in most instances. Alberta is the highest spending uh, province on health care, the highest spending province on education. In most areas, Alberta has the biggest, most active government in Canada. Yeah, fair point. Let's talk about your interview with Rachel Notley. It's a good one. I enjoyed it. People can check it out on the Hurley Burley, wherever they download their podcasts. I happen to listen to it on Apple. You talk to her a lot about, you know, her, her, her background, you talked to her a lot about what her plan is with regards to energy policy. Obviously, that's going to be huge uh, in the debates leading up to this election at the end of May. Her take on health care and then the anger and alienation that Albertans feel toward Ottawa. You know, even in promoting our interview with you today, I, I wondered, am I just trotting out an old, tired theme or is this a valid reality are politicians reminding albertans how mad they're supposed to be at ottawa or do you get the sense and did you get it from talking to rachel that it is a very real uh state of existence right now i think it's a real state of existence i mean i've been gone from saskatchewan for many years but i maintain a lot of contacts back there and in alberta and my conversations with those people suggest that the situation is you know qualitatively worse Uh, than it used to be. I grew up in Saskatchewan in the days of the National Energy Program, and you would have thought that that would have been, uh, you know, sort of the the high watermark of alienation. But I think it probably is worse now. And maybe it's another 30 years of disappointment uh, at federal governments that no matter what they uh, what their stripe is or where their where their seats come from, don't really seem to respond to 
to Western Canada. And then, and then, you know, she added a, an additional wrinkle, which is the Trudeau name. And, uh, you know, there's just such a narrative about the Trudeau family in Western Canada that I, I think that the fact that Justin Trudeau was the prime minister is in itself an alienating factor in Western Canada. Yeah, uh, we've got Cal in here on our live chat on YouTube. He says on the Hurley Burley podcast, he checked it out. He says Notley claims that in Calgary, her party, the Alberta NDP, has 10 times the number of supporters today than they had four years ago. And he's curious to hear your thoughts on that. Have you been chewing on that since she said it? Well, it means they've been doing a lot of organizational groundwork. It means that they are, uh, you know, a government that stumbled uh, accidentally into office in 2015, had to figure out how to do it. Uh, had the worst economic circumstances in which to try to do it and probably was too busy to genuinely prepare organizationally for the 2019 uh, for the 2019 provincial election. And what she was telling me is they've really done their spade work, whether it's on fundraising or whether it's on organization. They are ready this time. Their candidates are nominated. They're getting well known in their communities. I thought she was impressive on the organizational front. What would you do if you're a you, you mentioned you, you've run Kathleen Wynn's campaign, you've, you've participated in a whole bunch of campaigns, federal, provincial and otherwise. If, if you were uh, plotting out and planning, I mean, if you were sort of pouring the foundation right now of the Alberta NDP campaign, and I want to ask you this question from both sides. If you were planning Notley's campaign against Daniel Smith's conservatives, what would be the bedrock of that campaign? What would be the theme? What might be the slogan? It would be all about leadership for me. It's clear, and I discussed this with Ms. Notley yesterday, that, you know, the NDP has a brand problem in Alberta. Most new de- most Albertans do not wake up in the morning thinking of themselves as New Democrats. And until very, very recently, it wasn't, wasn't even a consideration. And there's lots of brand uh, negativity around the NDP all across Canada in terms of their management management of the economy or fear of what they might do if they were in charge of the economy. So I would never run NDP versus UCP in Alberta. That's a clear choice. But leadership is a different matter. Uh, And uh, Ms. Notley is uh, a very impressive person. She seems very together. She's thought through the issues and she's running against somebody in Danielle Smith, who, as Scott Reed famously said on The Curse of Politics a couple of weeks ago, sounds like she's got a family of raccoons running around in her head. And so I would run leader against leader, and I the, the battleground is Calgary, and I would try to convince Calgarians that Danielle Smith represents uncertainty, upheaval, and chaos, and not an economic future that 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 city is looking for. Okay, so now, hypothetically, you're a hired gun for the United Conservatives, and you're going to pour the foundation for their campaign to get Premier Smith elected for the first time in a general election to earn a full term uh, from Albertans. How do you plan that campaign? You run against the NDP and their economic record from when they were in office. And even though it is, uh, even though it is uh, uh, unfair because of oil prices, nonetheless, how people are going to remember it is that it was a tough time uh, in Alberta. And the second thing is you have as many federal provincial fights as you can while still sounding half-assed reasonable. Because when you have a Fed prof fight, you put Ms. Notley in an untenable position of either being on the side of Danielle Smith or being on the side of Justin Trudeau. And uh, so those are just fights that she absents herself from. And so you have the field all to yourself. We've got some great comments in the live chat here. Jason says the prime minister could walk on water and Albertans would be pissed that he didn't swim. Um, Alyssa says people need to get over Pierre Trudeau. She says it's ridiculous. <laughs> she says also what the United Conservatives are calling for today is what the National Energy Program, the NEP, was in the <laughs> 70s. She said it's hilarious. Is that accurate? No. No, because the National Energy Program was, and I'm a, I'm a liberal, but I'm a Western liberal, and the National Energy Program was a deliberate attempt by a federal government to diminish the amount of money that was going to Alberta and Saskatchewan and other oil producing countries and move that money federally. And uh, it was it was a wrongheaded policy. It was a wrongly motivated policy should never have existed. Nothing like that's on the table by any party right now. Uh, Dennis, by the way, I, sh- I-, I should let you know as well. You- you- it's nice to hear the praise. I mean, it's nice to know your tires are getting pumped. Uh, Dennis says this guy's a master of getting governments elected. Uh, with that endorsement from Dennis in the live chat, what sense are you getting 
um, in the context of how you think this might go down. Obviously, there's a lot of time between now and the end of May. Obviously, a lot could happen. But, but you know, yesterday we talked to, to two guys, you know, Evan Scrimshaw, Max Fawcett, both of them arguing that Rachel Notley may have already lost the election. Do you buy that? No. No, campaigns matter. What happens in the campaign matters. That's when people will be paying attention. There will be a leader's debate. That will matter. There will be advertising. That will matter. There will be the crucible of media scrutiny. That will matter. Uh, And Dennis, I just need to tell you that I'm every bit as expert at losing governments as I am at electing them. What was your toughest electoral loss? Uh, Well, I I, I guess... um, uh, there's two, and 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 one was the 2018 defeat um, in provincially in Ontario with Kathleen Wynne, where it just didn't seem that we could do anything in the campaign to make a difference. So, having just said the campaigns matter, uh, they did in that instance, and in that we could say things about the NDP that people would listen to, and we could say things about the Conservatives that they would listen to, but we couldn't say anything about ourselves anymore that they would listen to. So that was a very frustrating exercise. Mm. But losing in federally in 2006 because. Zach Ardelli, the commissioner of the RCMP, intervened and accused our finance minister, Ralph Goodell, of a criminal activity that was completely bogus um, and turned the tables on that election and turned what would have been a win into a loss. It was pretty crushing. You said you're a Western liberal. What's the difference? Is that just you trying to create a bit of distance between you and the Laurentian elites? Like, is there, is there a major ideological difference between a liberal, uh, you know, west of Manitoba or, or or west of Thunder Bay? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we come from a, a part of the country that has uh, a unique mindset about things. I have a lot more understanding of why Westerners feel alienated, both from the country and from its institutions. Um than people that come from other parts of the country do where they they didn't grow up with that. But I I feel it all the time myself still when I see things happen. Um, So there's that there's that aspect to it. Um, And, you know, when you come from Western Canada and you're a liberal, you you try to you try as best you can to represent Western Canada inside the Liberal Party and you try to shape the Liberal Party so that it's more responsive to Western Canada. I've spent my life doing that. Um, and as the polls would show in Alberta and Saskatchewan, with absolutely zero success over the course of my life. Mm. So. I sure enjoy, by the way, how you do your show. This is just a random observation, but we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about meeting people in the middle or talking at the table or or dialoguing or, or even debating people with whom we disagree. And and one of the things that I've really liked about your pod and, and, and the different projects that you undertake on is that you bring in people from drastically different. Back- I mean, I think of your interview with Hamish Marshall, for example. That's one example. I really enjoyed that one. That was probably, I don't know, a year ago, year and a half ago, something like that. But do you get the sense we talk about this a lot on this show. Do you get the sense that people are losing the ability or maybe at least the appetite to have those types of conversations to try to, I don't know if I say find common ground, maybe that, maybe that takes the question away in a strange direction, but, but, but do you see people with an appetite for those conversations anymore? Uh, Less and less, which is why I am doing the podcast I'm doing, because I still think that most people that get involved in politics are A, smart and able people, and B, people who, as best as they see the world, are trying to do good things, are trying to make a positive contribution. I want to hear what they have to say, and if I disagree, I'll understand it better. Uh, and maybe understand how to defeat those arguments better. And if I learn something, I learn something um, from that. I mean, I think there is a lot of polarization in the world right now. And people are, you know, the human brain is disinclined to seek out contrary viewpoints. So when you've settled on a point of view about the world, it's much more comfortable to find constantly voices that reinforce that for you and voices that confirm what you already think. And if I can get somebody to listen to a smart person like Hamish Marshall for an hour, they'll probably learn something. I want to ask you about John Tory's resignation. He submitted it formally last night 
uh, after the city, after, well, after Toronto Council passed the 2023 budget, he'll step down uh, formally tomorrow uh, after admitting he had a relationship with a former staffer. I understand here that there's a lot at play. Uh, I understand that there are personal factors at play. Uh, I know that, you know, I don't know how much people know about John Tory's family, but he married into a very powerful family. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that probably we don't know about. There's speculation here. But my direct question is, did he have to resign? I mean, there's a lot of politicians that have seen scandal, sexual scandal and otherwise, that d- refuse to go anywhere. Did he have to resign as mayor of Toronto? Well, I guess you can ask two questions, Ryan. You can say, did a politician have to resign in that scenario? And you can say, well, what we're learning in the post-shame era of our lives is that nobody has to resign for anything. Hmm. Is that as long as you're prepared to tough it out, as long as you're prepared to take any embarrassing question and blow it off, as long as you're prepared to have every news conference you do dominated by those kinds of questions and you're okay with that you can stay on yes people stay on could john tory stay on i'm likely because he's not that kind of politician and the questions would get more intense and they'd get more probing and they'd get more personal what trips was she on what was her purpose on those trips were trips scheduled so that you could go away with her how much public money was spent on your relationship in terms of keeping the two of you together all these questions that are going to go away now because he resigned would be very very live and i don't think he would have handled them very well and to add to this is an is a factor that's pretty significant which is that despite the fact that the woman is 31 years old there's still she's an employee of his and there's still a power imbalance and these days that's just not on i mean if a ceo sleeps with somebody in that situation they're going to get fired how bad is this Doug Ford story? Uh, he he won't say, and he and he bristled. Yeah, I mean, it got pretty tense yesterday in in, in a press scrum. Uh, journalists asking about this pre wedding event of his daughters, this so called stag and doe event, one hundred and fifty dollars a ticket uh, attended. Uh, it sounds like by a whole bunch of developers that that may or may not have either influenced the premier or hoped to influence the premier with this green belt development. Um, I know that people are paying attention to this across the country right now. Premier seems pretty pissed off by the questions. Uh, he asserts that the boys took care of the party. He doesn't know where the money went. He says that there was. He says uh, most notably, nobody can influence the Fords. How bad of a story is this for Ontario's premier? Ha 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 ha. <laughs> it's a terrible it's a terrible story. It is a terrible story. Let me take you back. Ontario has something called the Green Belt, which is an area surrounding the city of Toronto that is reserved for nature. Cannot be developed. Very very popular thing in Ontario and in the city of Toronto. Um Mr. Ford has for a long time thought that developing the Green Belt was the key to relieving housing pressure um in Ontario. However, in order to get elected, he had to promise not to touch the green belt. People knew he wanted to. He'd been seen uh, captured on video talking to developers about it. He had to promise not to do it. So he gets back into office and immediately announces that he's going to do it. And in the meantime, there's been some very suspicious activity in terms of investments in the green belt, i.e. developers buying up parts of the green belt that weren't scheduled to be developed. So there was no reason for them to be buying them unless they kind of knew something. And then this story of this party comes along, a stag and doe. Uh, In Western Canada, I don't think we have these things. But in Ontario, they've got these things called a stag and doe. And um, so developers were asked to come and contribute money and contribute even more money, buy a ticket to the thing, and then contribute more money when they were there. And he says, well, these are just all my buddies. They aren't developers in that context. They are my friends. And, well, that just, I don't think that takes away the conflict issue at all. That just makes it more difficult. And so in my view, this is now a big enough issue that he either has to abandon his policy on developing the green belt, or if he pushes through, it will be understood to have been a corrupt exercise and he will be in real danger in the next election. You can follow David Hurley on Twitter at The Hurley Burley. You can find his podcast and associated projects everywhere you download your podcast. I recommend you listen. It'll make you feel pretty darn smart. Thanks for your time today, pal. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. It's always a real pleasure to talk to you. I appreciate it. Always. You got it. There he is, the pride of Saskatchewan and a prairie lily on our guest roster.
<laughs> David Hurley. I love that. That conversation was presented by our friends at California Closets. I want you to go online right now. I know every time I talk about California Closets and our family's personal experience with them, this was years ago that we first hired the team at California Closets to get our lives organized in our main family room area as well as up in the room where Carrie and I are. We had a walk-in closet that just was not properly organized and quite frankly it was a mess in there. Well their team transformed our space. They're now getting into the garage game. You can transform your garage with custom storage. Turn it into a, a real showcase area of your home. Your primary investment your garage does not have to be ignored. Uh, California Closets has storage and design solutions no matter what your end game is. And their talented team of designers and installers all get started with a free consultation. You can check them out online today at californiaclosets.ca or give them a call at 780-469-1777. I'm excited. Coming up a little bit later on this spring, we're going to have a contest right here on Real Talk. Real Talkers, you're going to have a shot at a custom garage makeover. That's courtesy of our friends at California Closets. Hey, did you miss out on the Friesen Brothers sweet or savory charcuterie boxes for Valentine's Day? They're extending the offer through till February 20th. So you've still got a few days left to order your sweet or savory charcuterie box from our friends at Friesen Brothers. You go online to Friesen.com. That's F-R-E-S-O-N. The sweet one, obviously a ton of desserts and, and fabulous treat items. The savory, well, exactly what it sounds like. Meats and cheeses, beautiful olives, everything you expect on one of those charcuterie boxes. You can order it in advance or you can head in store and pick one up in 16 different Alberta communities. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. You know, we're talking about a lot about caps on utilities and rates and how much people are paying for things like natural gas, for electricity. Life's getting more expensive. That's why it makes more sense now than ever before to spend two minutes at parkpower.ca. Compare the rates to what you're paying right now versus what you could be paying with the friendly local utilities provider that is Park Power. Now, this is what our family did. We went online. I mean, this is my personal story. We punched in what we needed. That was for our residents. We punched in what we were paying. We took a look at what they could do for us. And quite frankly, when we bundled our utilities, we saved even more. I'm paying demonstrably less than we were before we went to Park Power. Now, the best thing you can do right now is remember the promo code REALTALK23. That's REALTALK23. When you bundle your utilities, internet, electricity, and natural gas, you could save up to $150. That's $50 per utility from our friends at Park Power. And of course, speaking of power, if you're looking at going green this year, if you're looking at accelerating your sustainability goals, it could be at your business, it could be at your home, heck, it could be at the family cottage, whether it's on or off the grid. The team at Kubi Energy is helping people realize their solar goals by reminding you that the technology, the reliability, the affordability of solar is better now than it ever has been. You can go to the blog link at kubienergy.ca to learn a little bit more about news, what's happening in solar news from around the energy industry, in lifestyle, the environmental, financial, and social impacts of solar energy and energy tech in our lives, and general solar knowledge. We understand you want to know more about what you're getting into. You want to know about what your investment's going to look like. Check out on their blog, Shining the Light on Winifred Stewart. You remember this contest on Real Talk when Kubi Energy gifted the Winifred Stewart Association 30 years of clean energy, taking Joey's home to net zero status? It's a feel-good story, one of hundreds that have been written by the team at Kubi Energy. That's kubienergy.ca. Well, friends, uh, in particular parents and caregivers, this is just a quick heads up that we're going to be talking right now about the magic of childhood. And that's going to involve some conversations about the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. And, and this is a heads up that maybe if there are young ones in the room, we might want to put on the earmuffs or maybe press pause. It's the only time I'll ever tell you to pause the show 
and we're really excited to welcome Shelly Cook. She's a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press, and she's a proud member of the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation. She's making her Real Talk debut this morning to talk about her new column out this week, Childhood Myths Will Be Missed. Shelly, it's great to see your face. How, how's life in Winnipeg these days? Uh, it's good, actually. It's really nice to be here. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, of course. Well, listen, I've been following you on Twitter for a while, and, and I love your takes. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, about your, your journalism project in just a second. But first of all, you're a, you're a mom, and you were, yeah. you were navigating waters. You and I have at least one thing in common, and that's we both have a seven-year-old in tow when we're out grocery shopping, and you faced a, <laughs> you faced a tough question the other day. Yeah, yeah. So my daughter, Riel, she's seven. Um, she'll be eight this year. Um, and when we were grocery shopping, she asked me, um, Mom, do you think the Easter Bunny is real? And, um, you know, I, I just I wasn't ready for the question. It sounds silly, but I really I don't know. I, I thought that the stage would last longer. So this question from my baby was was kind of um, jarring and I didn't know what to say. Um, and I think she sensed my awkwardness because I was like, well, what do you think? And she was like, well, it just doesn't make sense. And I was like, mm -hmm. what do your friends think? And um, eventually, like the conversation just dropped. And I think that she probably is smart enough to realize that, like, I was being awkward and she would just drop it. So we didn't actually get to uh, any sort of resolve, but uh, it's coming coming this is the second time she's asked about this so well you've you've got uh you've you've just been through valentine's day with with your littles and i want to talk to you about that by the way valentine's day as you tweeted about you posted <laughs> these endearing and wonderful photos of your little one getting ready to, to hand out valentine's at school but but that could prompt questions about cupid uh you've got saint patrick's day coming up and you might have to navigate the waters around leprechauns and then you've got easter sure. and, and so i would imagine the question is going to going to resurface you write about this, and it sounds like you maybe landed on a strategy. Are you sticking with what you wrote about in the free press the other day? Um, honesty? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think so. I, I think, uh, like, she's got two older sisters, um, my stepkids, and um, I love those kids. They are like my children, but they have a mom who I'm very close with. And she navigated those questions. So I never had to navigate those with the older two. Um, and they've been really good with my younger daughter. You know, they we know to keep the, the magic alive. But um, yeah, you know, when she asks again, her dad and I are just going to kind of break it to her. I think she knows. So. Mm. Was it something she heard about at school, do you think? Um, I think she's just really like a good critical thinker. Like she may have heard about it at school. She said they don't talk about it much, but she just said magic bunnies don't make sense. Mm. Um, you know, and a couple months ago, I guess maybe a month or two ago, it was sort of the same thing about Santa. And she's like, it just makes sense that he can go to everybody's house. And I was like, hmm? Mm. Mm hmm, it's magic. <laughs> We've had the same conversation in our house, and and uh, and I remember Wyatt. He's our seven year old, and and he said to me, he said, "You know, Dad, there's kids at school that don't believe in Santa." And and as the parent, you kind of feel that little surge of adrenaline because you know at mm -hmm. some point it's going to happen, but you kind of hope it never does. You you kind of hope that your kids can make it to twelve or, or thirteen you know, believing in the magic. And so, and so I was aghast. I said, what? I said, they're not believers. Yeah. And, and I said, well, what do you think about it? And he said, well, and you could tell he was wrestling with it. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, your mom and I, I said, we're a family of believers, right? I mean, I'm stealing language right from the Polar Express. But I said, I said, we're believers in, in this family. But I have been, I do think about it from time to time. I mean, the tooth fairy is another great example. And, and, mm -hmm. and I've been wrestling with, and this is why I wanted to bring you on to talk about this. I've been wrestling with either honesty as the best policy or also the magic of trying to preserve something, that beauty of childhood that, that in so many ways as a, a toddler, once they can walk before they couldn't, you know, once they can yeah. talk before they couldn't, uh, these phases of life are over before we're ready for yeah. them to be over. And you almost mourn the loss of that period of their time, of their life. Well, and, and, like I, I, I'd written in my column too, um, you know, we're ushering them into these new stages constantly, often without even realizing that 
we have said goodbye to this little person that that we've known and there is so much grief in that like it's such a privilege it is such an honor to be able to have kids and to be a mom or or parent um but yeah there's so much grief associated with it and you don't get it back and I think like for us, I would love to keep the magic for as long as possible. I wrote in my column that I was in grade six when I stopped believing. And I think my mom kind of had to gently nudge me out of that, that closet because um, like, I just didn't want to stop believing in Santa. So um, it was probably for the best at that time going, you know, going into middle school. But um, I think for our daughter, we'll probably you know, we'll be honest. Uh, and, you know, there also comes great responsibility with that too, though, you know, because some of her friends probably still believe. So we'll have to have that talk about being respectful about what they believe and kind of letting them have the magic. So, yeah. Yeah. I was talking mm-hmm. to, to my wife just the other day and, and we, we've welcomed a newborn into our family this year too. So there's a really interesting dynamic. You know, you have, we have a yeah. seven soon to be eight year old and then we have an eight-month-old, and, and so our little guy, uh, people can check out. My wife's better at posting photos and videos on Instagram <laughs> than I am. People can follow her at Carrie Skelton, but like you see this video here of the of the brothers together. And and I and I caught Carrie, my wife, the, the other day, sort of you know wistfully looking off, right? And I said, "What are you thinking about? What's on your mind?" And and with our older guy, Wyatt, she said, I, "I was just realizing that there will be a day where I don't hold him anymore, where I don't carry him anymore, but but I won't know in that moment." that that's the last time I'm carrying him. And and it hit me. I mean, it hit me like a punch yeah. between the eyes, you know? And I was sharing this with a friend of ours. We were just talking about it. And and, and this is a friend whose, whose children are, are now out of the house, right? They're, they're older. They're, they're in their young adult years. And she said, you still hold them. You just hold them differently. The hugs mean mm-hmm. more. You're still going to embrace them. There's still that. You may not be lifting them off the ground, but there's still that. And I don't know, I guess it's just part of parenting is, is navigating those, those phases, those doors closing, and, the, and then the new ones opening. The new friendship, the, the magic that could be an adult friendship with your children as they grow. Yeah, you know what? Like, I think somebody had explained it to me once, like, every next stage is, is the best stage. And it's so true. I think, yeah, it's, it's just, it's really hard to let go of our babies and kind of watch them grow and see their independence. Like it's so awesome, but it's, it's really hard. Um, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. We're, we're lucky, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Hey, can I, can I ask you about your, your, your career and the work that you're doing with the free press as, as a journalist and as a storyteller about this, this reader bridge project, you're the, you're the manager of this, right? For the free press. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at the free press, I've been there for a little over two years years um we started this project it's called the reader bridge um and what we're trying to do is we are trying to be better in our journalism we're trying to um tell more um diverse stories from different communities um i think one thing um like i'm indigenous i'm from broken head Ojibwe nation i'm super proud of my culture and heritage um that being said though i I didn't grow up in community and i'm sort of navigating and finding my way back like so many other people um but they're like in in our coverage there there lacked a lot of diversity and a lot of different sort of perspectives and stories and um so my job in this role is to try to make our coverage better and to tell these stories and to build relationships and to be really reciprocal with people um you know not just swoop into a community um when trauma happens and tell that story but to actually build a relationship and to celebrate and to tell these good stories that sometimes get overlooked so Mm. That's my role. That's my job. And I love it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's such a cool assignment. I was reading up on it a little bit before you and I connected. People can check it out at winnipegfreepress.com slash reader dash bridge. We'll have the link uh, in the show notes in the podcast and on YouTube so people can can easily uh, check in on that and, and, and learn and, and read more about it, including a link to media literacy, which I think is great. Uh, you know, this this almost has to be a holistic approach, right? Pardon me if what I'm saying is obvious, but but there's there's learning that needs to happen starting at the storyteller front and uh, with regards to media literacy. I mean, I even think, you know, one example off the top of my head, um, I thought that the, the Confederacy of, of, of Treaty 6 uh, here in Alberta in particular uh, during the Pope's visit uh, just this past mm-hmm. summer, 
their comms team, their media team did a remarkable job. I, I'd never actually seen anything like it, which is which is both good and bad. Uh, but I'd never seen anything like it. The media literacy that they were embarking on, it, helping to to help journalists understand the magnitude of the stories they were telling, how to properly and with sensitivity speak to survivors, how to yeah. enter communities respectfully, how, you know, to request interviews, to everything from from capturing photos and video everything uh and then on the flip side which i guess is probably part of your mandate is is recruiting the storytellers like making available opportunities for people who otherwise mm -hmm. may not have those doors open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and and that's sort of it like i think um you know newsrooms um and journalism um you know it's it's getting better but it, it for a long time was a very predominantly white um industry and that's that's great but we need more perspectives we need more storytellers because that's that's sort of the thing is that like people have a lived experience they have um their own sort of way of of knowing and telling stories so um yeah so sort of, we have a pitch portal for freelancers who want to pitch us stories um specifically for the reader bridge it's for freelancers of color um and photojournalists of color who want to pitch us stories um to, to kind of have those perspectives and to give opportunity and to share this platform because it, it's really important that, you know, um, people are sort of telling their own stories. Yeah. And is there anything, as far as you know, uh, anything else like this across the country right now, or is this relatively unique with what the free press is doing and what you're quarterbacking? Um, you know, I think CBC is sort of doing, I don't know if they're doing anything like a reader bridge, but we'd sort of, uh, we held some feeding the conversation lunches uh, last year where we, we met with communities, people from different communities, and we just sort of had this lunch and just sort of talked about, um, you know, what, what would you like to see and here's what we're doing. And we just, we met and it was just really having a conversation over lunch. And I know CBC has done something like that and that's super awesome. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure other people, I think diversity is so big and, you know, um, sort of, being inclusive is really, really big for like not only journalism, but just sort of society now. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. But I think um, it's great that people want to to be more diverse and tell stories that maybe haven't been told. So true. We we had a, a storytellers. We have a, a tradition here on Fridays of a Real Talk roundtable. And uh, sure. we welcomed storytellers. Uh, to the roundtable just this past Friday in the context of Black History Month and, and spent some time learning about how representation factored into it and, and how regardless of, of where your talent may lie or your potential may lie, you need to be able to see yourself. You need to be able to yeah. see yourself represented. And and I just think it's so cool. Um, I, I, re I really think the initiative itself, I've, I've been checking out some of the stories that have been written here uh, by freelancers, by contributors to it. Again, people can check it out. It's Reader Bridge through the Winnipeg Free Press. Shelly Cook, our guest, a columnist and the manager of Reader Bridge, and of course, a very proud mama as well. <laughs> Thanks for making time. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to talk to us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so nice. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. You as well. You can follow Shelly on Twitter at Shelly A. Cook. That Reader Bridge program is so cool. Let us know what you think. Anytime that something on this show resonates with you, we want to hear about it. Um, this helps us plan and plot out future episodes. It helps us understand the types of stories that you want to hear told right here on your favorite show on Real Talk. This conversation was presented by our friends at Eden Landscaping, a custom landscape builder with more than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. Uh, take a second today to browse their portfolio. If, if, if you know what's coming up this spring, you know, as soon as that snow starts to melt, you're going to look out at that lawn and just go, we can do better. You want to maybe get a patio done, maybe some beautiful stonework like what they did out in Sherwood Park. You can see that feature project, a backyard oasis. This was featured on a Greenland garden tour back in the day uh, in Balmoral Heights neighborhood. The client's a little bit apprehensive. This goes, so goes the story. Uh, but the team at Eden was, was able to talk them through the build process, right? And there was an adjustment 
through that process. They realized, for example, after the design had been done, they needed a shed. And so Eden integrated that into the design. They wanted the shed to match the house's architecture, sourcing off cedar shakes and soffits and stucco and, of course, beautiful lighting. And then it turns out, I mean, at the end of the day, the synergy here in the design, effortless. The highlights were the Rundle Stone walkway, a custom cast iron fence, a natural stone staircase, a raised fire pit. This was the vision in Balmoral Heights. Maybe it's a vision you share. Maybe yours is completely different. The team at Eden has been doing it all for more than two decades, earning referrals and return business. You can get the consultation process started today so you can have that project done in time for the summer. You can contact them at landscapeedmonton.ca. If you're feeling the hunger today and you need to grab something quick, don't compromise on the quality of your lunch or dinner. At the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park, you'll find the sauced and tossed honey barbecue glazed chicken strip baskets. Now, uh, the chicken strips at Dairy Queen tower over the other competitors. You know Dairy Queen has actually first crack at the choice cuts across North America. There's a real story behind this, and it's a fascinating one. They've got your cravings covered. Try them out. Maybe again, maybe for the first time. It's the honey barbecue sauced and tossed chicken strip basket, 100% seasoned, all tenderloin chicken strips. You don't get those elsewhere. You'll find them in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road, the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. You know, if you're watching on YouTube, Johnny's given us this beautiful wide shot of this studio. This studio was built from start to finish by the team at Complete Care Restoration. They've been doing construction and renovation projects for years, in particular, disaster restoration. That's right. Flood, fire, mold, and asbestos removal. I mean, these are the nightmares that no home or business owner wants to navigate. The one thing that can make it better is having a team you trust to do it right from the first consultation all the way through to that final coat of paint. We could not be happier with the job that the team at Complete Care Restoration did in our studio, and we recommend them. If disaster strikes, you can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. At Apex Automation, they're looking for Canada and quite frankly, the world's most talented professional engineers. That's right, they're always hiring. And I know that this is going to resonate with a professional engineer out there that's just feeling underappreciated or bored stiff in their current setup. Go to apexautomation.ca, click on the careers link to find out more about open opportunities right now. Apex is always hiring, building a culture where amazing people like you can do your best work. If you're ready to grow your career, challenge yourself, learn new skills, you've come to the right place at apexautomation.ca. And before we wrap for today, uh, this is just a public service announcement from me to all you bourbon lovers out there. If you haven't yet got your hands on the Real Talk Maple Bourbon, you better do it soon, because this is about to sell out. That's right. Go to whiskeydrop.ca. That's W-H-I-S-K-Y, whiskeydrop.ca. Use the search tool to punch in Real Talk, and that's where you'll find our cask number two, a maple bourbon masterfully crafted by the team at Broken Barrel. They actually smash up old maple syrup barrels. They crush them to smithereens and then they take those pieces of wood the splinters called staves and they toss them in with the whiskey in a virgin oak barrel to infuse a fabulous maple flavor now you can pick up these bottles a special cask release chosen by us here at real talk in partnership with pws imports you can pick it up in person at whiskey drop in west edmonton or you can order online and they will ship anywhere in canada so whether you're tuning in from Calgary or Victoria or Thunder Bay, you can get your bottle of Whiskey Drop delivered. Real Talk cask number two maple bourbon by Broken Barrel today. Again, that's at whiskeydrop.ca. Tomorrow's show is going to be one you're not going to want to miss. 
For the first time in this show's history, from start to finish, the entire guest roster will be joining us in studio. Jeremy Clausus is on his way up from Calgary today. He's the publisher, the founder of The Sprawl. We're going to talk about some of the stories that are on his radar as an independent journalist out of Calgary. And then three talented improv artists in what promises to be a gut-busting edition of the Real Talk Roundtable. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com. 